Hey, good evening. I'm uh, just going to wait to see if anyone else is able to log on and then we'll get started. Notes, as always, are kind of down there on Facebook and um, uh, this will be on YouTube when we're done <clears throat> at some stage. Okay, so uh, this evening I thought for some fun I might look at the question what evolution can teach us about God and it's it's a different approach I suppose uh, because so often when we look at questions like evolution and theology or evolution and Christianity we want to say, well, a lot of for a lot of people, there uh, it's a pick one, if that makes sense as a topic. Um, but I, I think that there's something to be said in this. So, so yeah, that's the question we're looking at. Uh, it's, it's 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 essentially what's called natural theology. Uh, natural th theology is. Uh, a way of looking into the existence and the attributes of God without referring to anything supernatural. Uh, so, so anything that would be, in a sense, a, a direct revelation of the nature of God, miracles, uh, messages directly from heaven, um, the incarnation, God with us, all of those are excluded from natural theology because they're about a direct uh, revelation of the nature of God. So so that's essentially, we bracket those things out. And we say we're just looking at the things that are open to everyone. Anyone can look at, at this and think these same things through. Uh, just to let you know that this isn't something I've just come up with now, uh, Tertullian, who uh, was writing a long time ago um, in his book Against Marcion, uh, made a reference. It is Against Marcion, uh, Book 1, Chapter 18. Uh, we maintain that God must first be known from nature and afterwards authenticated by instruction, from nature by his works, by instruction through his revealed announcements. So for Tertullian, you actually start with nature. You start at looking at the world and working from that to a picture of God, if you will. Now, uh, it's also a biblical idea. Uh, you could quite easily make the argument that Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 are working in the same way. But I quite like uh, Psalm 19. It goes, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens He has set a tent for the sun. You see, the psalmist the psalmist is saying we can look at, at the world, uh, at the heavens, the stars, those sorts of things, uh, the earth, the firmament, um, and we can, uh, we, can, we can tell something about the nature of God. In fact, we might almost say nature is one book by which we might uh, access something of God, and scripture, the Bible, is another book. And, and you'll, you'll see this metaphor if you read in this area. It's the book of nature and the book of scripture. And it's, so, so that's the kind of the, I'm going to say the, 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 the dichotomy, although it's not supposed to be a dichotomy. It's supposed to be two sources pointing us in the same direction. So uh, a legitimate task. Now, I'm going to be honest. And I want to start with why I would not normally be involved in natural theology. Why I am a little suspicious of natural theology. 
And so the first um, is the, the question of character. So when we look at the world in whatever way, and we make some sort of abstraction about the nature of God, and we're going to kind of do that in a bit, what we don't get is anything of the character of God necessarily. We might, especially not, I, I feel, if we are being authentic in the fact that we look at Scripture and we ask, what can we extrapolate from that? So we, we're not even working with Scripture, perhaps. We are just working, at the, working with the book of nature. What are we going to get? And we're not going to get any character. We're just going to get abstract concepts. We're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to go, oh, look, there's a creation. God is creative. Um, oh, look, the universe is a mixture of, you know, uh, interrelates in certain ways. Perhaps God is relational. But we don't actually get anything of the character of God. And so I think it's a, it's a useful thing, but it certainly isn't a standalone. So that's the first reason why I would not normally engage too heavily in this. Uh, the second reading, reason is because over time there has been a shifting understanding of the structuring of the universe and how that might impact our theology. So, uh, one of historically, we kind of viewed uh, the world as you know the dome, and above the dome were the gods and all the rest of it. But the, the, there was a dome, and then there was the saucer, and humanity kind of lived on the saucer. And yet we were the highest of the animals. So we, so um, based on sort of Genesis chapter one and those sorts of things. And so we had this kind of view. Now, along comes Galileo and Copernicus and uh, Tycho Brahe and a couple of others, and they start to go, yeah, maybe the Earth is not at the center of the system. In fact, maybe the Sun is at the center. And we've got a heliocentric universe. And then we kind of look further out and we got a um, solar systems, uh, galaxies, sorry, you know, um, and mega clusters and all the rest of it. And that, so if we base our theology on, on an old science, then either God becomes outdated because he's locked to, God is locked to old science, you know, pre Tycho Brahe and pre Copernicus and pre Galileo and pre Darwin and pre Mendeleev and pre all you know all all those pretty smart fellas. Um, or we have this very rapid shifting picture of God. You can actually see the influence in metaphors that people come up with. So one of the oldest metaphors for say the problem of evil uh, is the metaphor of a tapestry. So, you know, you look, at it, you look at the world, and the world has pain and suffering, and the metaphor, the idea is that if you can step back and you can look at it from God's perspective, it creates a beautiful tapestry. But because we are tied up in the, in the, war, in the warp and weft and all the rest of it, it, it feels messy. Or the, the image of finding a watch in a desert, and it's from design, and so... So obviously at that stage, where that metaphor only starts to kick in when you have watches that are, or clocks, that are finely mechanically designed. But you also then end up with a picture of God who is uh, a finely tuning mechanic. Um, so you kind of, if you tie yourself too closely to scientific knowledge, in a sense, you get... you. you and then, and then science changes, and science always changes. It's it's a it's a constant, constantly approximating. Uh, I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem. You you don't want your theology to be able to be overturned by someone's latest hypothesis. Uh, so so I think that's it. That's an issue. The other one is a personal issue. Um, let me tell you a story. I remember uh, hearing somebody say, you know, in history, history goes in these 500-year waves, 
And every 500 years, you get this kind of significant religious overturning and, um, uh, you know, just you get all these kind of events every 500 years. And you get Abraham and Moses and the Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad and, um, you know, so, so, so that's the, the picture, right? I thought, well, that's very interesting. And I was talking to a history teacher about it. And the history teacher went, yeah, that's fine. Uh, as long as you ignore everything that doesn't fit into that pattern. I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, you see, it's, you know, if you go, oh, every 500 years, you know, give or take 50 or 60 years. Well, suddenly you can go from, let's say, the year 440 to the year 560. And then, you know, 500 years later, gets you to the year around a thousand but you know maybe not maybe maybe it's actually like 900 to 1100 and 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 suddenly you you you, you're starting to it starts to fall apart the same the same problem can happen here if we have a lens that says say uh god is uh angry and retributive and then we look to nature we will see anger and retribution, and we will we will want to uh, we'll, we'll attribute that back to God. It's one of those things where it's just a slightly more sophisticated version of us painting God in our own image. So it, it, it's a concern of mine. It's a concern of mine. Um, yeah. And then I just wanted, and um, if you've got the notes, you'll see that I shared a little uh, cartoon. Uh, it's called Coffee with Dr. Zayas. If you're not familiar with it, there's a website called uh, Babylon Bee, and they do Coffee with Jesus. Um, and uh, it's quite funny. And this is a, a sort of a, a slightly scientific uh, take on, on that. And I thought it was quite humorous. And it's on evolution, sort of, and on theology. So I thought I'd share it with you. So, I want to kind of move into a little bit of actual theolo uh, evolution stuff. And what I've done is I've taken two of the mechanics of evolution, two of the mechanisms of evolution. Uh, and there are a number. So, the, uh, there's heritable variation, uh, fitness, competition, uh, those sorts of things. Heritable variation picks in, takes into consideration uh, genetic drift. Uh, and uh, well, um, genetics and drift. So, what heritable variation means is that uh, whenever you shuffle the genetic cards, um, you're going to create an entirely new uh, creature. However, it will have elements in common with its parents. And so it will inherit, so it'll have variation, but it'll also inherit that. Now, in uh, the theory of evolution, the idea is that if one of those traits uh, s increases its chance of uh, survival up to the point where it can breed, then what you get is you get that trait passed on more than if it didn't have that trait. And so over time... One of the other things about uh, evolution is that it assumes long periods of time. Many, many, many breeding cycles, essentially. So heritable variation. Um, and the other one is this idea of fitness. Uh, you've probably heard the term survival of the fittest. Uh, and it's... It's not always what we would think. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. The, the, the definition of fitness here isn't necessarily... Uh, let's take it in kind of human context. The fittest person might not be physically the fittest. The fittest is the person who is most capable of surviving in the environment such that they have children who might inherit their genetics and that those children will have children. So let's say, for example... Uh, I was, you know, a super fit gym junkie. 
but that made me a really, really bad parent. I'm not saying gym junkies are bad parents. I'm just using this as a sort of an on the fly example. So much so that my children um, ended up getting sick and not being able to have children their own of their own because I dropped the ball as a parent. My genetics, even though I'm super fit and buff because I go to the gym, <laughs> that's a joke, um, don't get passed on. I'm not fit in that sense. On the other hand, you know, you're a, you're a slightly overweight, tubby kind of person, um, but you do well, uh, you, you're able to get married, you have children, those children grow up, they're able to do well. In that context, the slightly tubby overweight guy who manages to get his kids to breeding age uh, is actually more fit for survival uh, than the person who's a bad parent but, but is physically fit. Okay, so survival of the fittest there doesn't always mean what, it, what um, we would think it means. So I, I, I thought about those two uh, tr um, mechanics of evolution. I thought, well, what if we were to suggest that those two mechanics, which seem to be kind of universally applied whenever it comes to, to life, what if they said something about the very nature of God? And I thought about heritable variation. And I thought, well, what if that says that God loves or values novelty, newness? Now, novel can mean a whole range of things. But it, it, it means newness. It means that there's something constantly pushing on the edge into new and unexplored territory. What if God values uniqueness? What if God values uh, the individuality of a thing? As if that is important in and of its own self. And perhaps when we talk about heritable traits, what if God values memory? Our... And I don't just mean our cognitive memory. What if God values the experience of our past and holds it into the future? This could be something that evolution might teach us about the nature of God. The next one, fitness. I was thinking about this, and I was, and it's 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 a um. It's it's an interesting topic. And I was thinking about fitness. And I was thinking, you know, the definition of fitness in this instance is almost self-sacrificing. You see, the definition of fitness is not about me, but about that which comes after me. It's about the idea that what comes after is of great value. And so the true definition of fitness is a self-sacrificing one. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, so, so for God, it's more important that we create an impact than we just happen to be alive on this earth for a very long time. I thought, isn't that interesting? So then I was thinking about the products of evolution. You know, what is ev what is evolution evolved uh, produced, and. Um, if you if you have the notes, you'll see sort of um, it looks like a semicircle with a whole range of colors and things like that, and um, and it's a tree of life, but it's a kind of a it's an odd tree of life because it sort of starts in the middle and then works out, but you've got to, it it bends and things like that. Uh, if you get a chance, I put a link to the website where I found that one, and they've got this really cool little thing where you can click two aspects of it. And it'll tell you how long back in time those two things had a common ancestor. So I clicked octopi, or an octopus, and humans. Because I thought oh, those are two very different uh, creatures. But they're two very intelligent creatures. Most humans, anyway. Um, and most, octopi, uh, most octopus. I just thought it was a fascinating thing how far back in history we have a common ancestor. Very cool, very cool. But I was thinking about it. So what are the products of evolution? You know, what they say, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a cake. The, the question isn't so much about the eggs. 
and the flour. The question is about the cake. Yeah? Um, and so, 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 you know, if we think of evolution as kind of being like a cake, uh, the present day is, is the cake, and the mechanics are the, are the, um, the ingredients and, and, and the cooking instructions. So evolution has, the forces of evolution have created a very varied universe. Very varied. Um, far more varied, in fact, than most people are aware. Um, once again, if you do have that little tree of life there and you have a quick look at it, you'll see that, uh, you know, all, almost all the animals we're aware of take up maybe a third of that and that's being pretty generous because it's not accurate we take up a much smaller component realistically um, then there's fungi and all sorts of things all sorts of very odd creatures at microscopic levels uh, so so the universe is very creative very creative and I think it's fabulous um, it also appears to be not determinable by prior conditions. So one of the things about evolution uh, is that if you were to look at the starting conditions, you wouldn't necessarily be able to determine the end results. And I think evolution is one of the strongest arguments for freedom uh, within the universe. It's, it's a, such a strong argument for, for freedom, for uh, choice and, and, and creativity. I, I find it interesting that how very fragile and yet how very robust life is. Um, there have been a number of great extinction times, you know, global ice ages, mass extinctions, and yet life is still out there. And it, it's amazing. And in my, in my mind, it puts to my mind the incarnation, the incarnational nature of God. And it is deeply relational. It is deeply relational. And for Christians, we would use language like loving in that context. And it is dynamic, active. So these are things that we might infer about God from the book of nature and the chapter on evolution in that context. Uh, so um, I see that there's some hellos. Oh, and I've got a hello there from Simon and Jocelyn. And uh, David has asked um, if I have any thoughts on genetically modified crops. Um, my thoughts on genetically modified crops kind of come into in a number of areas. So uh, let, let, let me think. So, sometimes people say it's playing God. Um, you know what? If we say things like God is creative, free, loving, and people want to play God, more power to them. I, I, I don't think there's anything inherently supernatural or evil in genetically modified crops. Don't have a problem with it in that sense. I do think it becomes problematic when it's about, um, and it has been used in this way by some of the bigger corporations, it's been used to lock people to a particular uh, poverty cycle, uh, it's been used to uh, lock people out of other types of crop rotation, and so when it becomes a tool for uh, oppression or repression, then I have a problem with it. But once again, that's not because it's genetically modified. That's because of the way it's used. Um, I know some people have concerns also with genetically modified crops and uh, the, the law of unforeseen consequences. You know, um, uh, what's going to happen if the, if the genetically modified uh, wheat ends up getting too far into the world and that becomes a problem. So I, I think it's a legitimate concern. Um, and it's theological in that it has an impact on how we uh, view people and the future and those sorts of things. But I, I, I don't think that they are necessarily theologically problematic 
in their ideal form. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any other questions. I don't see any. Um, so uh, I'm going to leave it there uh, unless there are any other more questions. I'm going to say thanks for watching. This will go up on YouTube at some stage. Uh, and uh, good night.